I'm Jay Townsend. Uh, I'm here today to introduce uh, a great friend of mine in this world with whom I will soon celebrate a decade of friendship. Her name is Sylvie DiGiusto. She is the best-selling author, author of a book called The Image of Leadership. She is one of the world's foremost experts on branding, marketing, creating a great public image, and the all-important topic of how to make a good impression with all that you meet. I would also say that Sylvie is kind of a kindred spirit in that we both share an insatiable intellectual curiosity about just about everything. And it is to Sylvie that I would also pay one of the highest compliments I could pay any human being. Every time I talk to Sylvie, I learn something I did not know. Sylvie, that's a compliment. <laughs> So recently, Sylvie penned an article, and I want to make sure I get the title of this correct. Sylvie, you penned an article titled How to Influence Voters and the Importance of First Impressions in Politics. There's a lot of terrific information in that piece, and I know from attending some of your webinars and seminars that you've kind of packaged what you do to help people create a great brand and a great image into something you call the ABCDEs. And I wonder if you could kind of dive into that and then we'll kind of go through them one by one for the benefit of the candidates who watch this YouTube channel. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me here. Uh, I want to give one compliment uh, back before we get started. Uh, not only am I lucky to be in your area of influence and have learned so many uh, things from you throughout the past years, you have always been my advisor and the first person to call if I had any questions, but in particular questions related to politics, but I'm the extra lucky one because I can also call you a friend. So thank you very much for inviting me and thank you for this conversation about a topic both of us are very, very passionate about. Mm -hmm. And um, as you mentioned, I help um, leaders um, and professionals and individuals to understand how they are perceived by the world and how people instantly make major decisions about them. Mm -hmm. So before we walk into the A, B, C, D, E, I want everybody to understand those decisions that we make have nothing to do with the fact if we are good human beings or bad human beings, if we want to make them or not. We automatically make them in our brains, in our huge unconscious mind that is filled with past experiences, emotions, uh, a lot of unconscious biases that we carry in us. And it happens on the backside of our mind without us really noticing. But once we know that those things happen and why they happen, Mm -hmm. we can better control them. And this is where the A, B, C, D, E framework comes in. Yeah. So as a candidate, if you are running from an office, no matter if it's for a small local office or, or a very important nationwide office, the principles are always the same. The A stands for your appearance, like it or not. People just look at you. We are human uh, we have human beings that um, think in visual pictures. Our brain is actually quite lazy. It doesn't like to work. So it takes a shortcut through our eyes. That's why uh, we are visual creatures. And that visual appearance that you give off to potential voters that includes first the suit you are born in, your body image. Are you tall? Are you short? Are you overweight? Are you underweight? Do you take care of your body? And then what does your clothing say about you? Uh, the style that you have, the fit, the quality, the brands that you wear. And to be very clear, there is no one size fits all formula. We have seen very often in politics that you don't have to follow the old fashioned rules anymore. A suit is a suit and that is what a politician has to wear. It's a rather the outside perspective that you need to take and define uh, 
who are my potential voters mm -hmm. and how would like it or what would they like to see on me and then it's your accessories your hair your makeup your shoes the entire visual picture that you create but to be very clear looking good is great but it is not enough and mm -hmm. there have been a lot of examples in the political scene in the past that looking good alone doesn't really work but it's a beginning it's the start of a journey you take potential voters on because at one point you're going to be for behave your attitude for example is it positive is it negative how do you approach your potential voters your attitude speaks louder than any words that you can ever say it leaves your mouth before words leave your mouth right mm -hmm. and people react on that attitude emotionally that being said, what about the level of your emotional intelligence? How self-aware are you? Are you in control of your emotions? Do you have emotional balance? And how do you react if something triggers your emotions? How are you able to read a room? How are you able to read the emotions of your potential voters? And then simple uh, business etiquette skills. Do you shake hands at events? Do you look people into their eyes? Um, or are you down on your phone? Do you let them walk out of an elevator first or last? How do you behave in interactions? And then at one point you're going to say something, right? And it's about communication, what you say and how you say it. So the C for communication. Your voice is a very powerful tool. It's like an instrument that you play at every single event you are on, but we never learn how to play that instrument. Mm -hmm. So what are you doing to um, improve your voice cap uh, capacities? And then you're going to say something. We know, for example, that the first 11 words in every conversation are the most important ones. How are you starting your speeches? How do you greet potential voters at the events? What are the first words coming out of your mouth? Because they set a tone. But be very careful, communication is not just about speaking. Very often we speak without saying words, with our bodies, for example, your body language, your facial expressions. Those are all this sub-information that we add to our words. And if they are different, voters just feel uncomfortable. You are behaving in a certain way, but you are saying something different, right? And the most important part of communication is actually not speaking. It is listening. Are you an active listener or do you just go out to your events with your message in mind, which is important, and you want to share that message with potential voters, but you actually don't listen to them and their questions and react to their questions with the right answers. Mm -hmm. So the ABCD is kind of the basic formula that you need to take into consideration, but I added the D. And why that? Because especially in politics, most often nowadays, we don't make that first impression anymore in person. We make it in some sort of digital way. So the D is for your digital footprint. Yes, you might still walk from door to door and knock at doors and find your potential voters and have the opportunity to talk with them, but most often we don't have that opportunity anymore. We send out emails for example, and those emails do not just impact the potential voters you sent them to, they might forward them and forward them and forward them and your email footprint ends up in inboxes you don't even know. Quite possibly in the inbox of your competitor, for example, the person you run against the two. And then your website, what does your website say about you? When they Google your name, what do they actually find about you on Google besides your website? And what do they find, for example, on social media? And make no mistake, especially as somebody in uh, public service and as a politician, they do not differentiate between a, the private person that you are and the politician that you are. Uh, because if there are two things that don't belong together, it's the internet and private. So what assumptions do they make 
based on the digital footprint that you leave behind, either, mm -hmm. either consciously or unconsciously. And then last but not least, the E stands for your environment. It should actually stand for everything because it's everything that surrounds you. Potential voters also take into consideration who are the other people you hang out with? Who is in your campaign team? What about your family? Your family is part of that campaign team too. What do they post on social media, for example? How do they look like? How do they behave? Uh, your office, if you give an insight into your campaign office, the car that you drive, the vacation you went on. We have seen many, many, many occasions in the past where potential voters or the press took out a piece of information totally out of context and made it a big topic because it actually didn't happen in your control, your ABCD. It happens in somebody else's uh, control around you. Mm -hmm. So your entire environment matters too. So that was a very quick run through right. the ABCDE. All right. So we'll just summarize a second. A is the appearance. B, your behavior. C, your communication skills. D is your digital footprint. E is the environment around you. Okay, now I will interject here and say that it isn't just one of these that a political candidate has to get right. They have to get all of them right. And Sylvia, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the campaigns I've been involved with and pull out certain instances and kind of fire a question at you because you in, when in the infancy, in the infancy of my career, which started 40 years ago, every candidate, most of whom were men, wore mm -hmm. a suit. Mm -hmm. Didn't matter where they were. If they were at a plant gate, they wore a suit. If they were speaking, they wore a suit. If they were going door to door, they wore a suit. Uh, the female candidates, which were few and far between 40 years ago, uh, but if they were there, they dressed up. Now, it's not so much anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think the starkest example I saw this last year was a campaign in Pennsylvania where the Democratic candidate wore shorts and a sweatshirt at many campaign appearances. Mm -hmm. The Republican candidate always wore a suit with a red tie. He lost. The guy that looked a little disheveled one. Now, they defied conventional wisdom that they would be so starkly different in their attire. But I wonder if you can address why it worked for the guy who wasn't wearing a suit. Well, uh, first of all, the rules 40 years ago don't apply today anymore, right? Mm -hmm. uh, today, not just politicians, also organizations have the challenge that while we had guidelines and strict rules that helped us to look professional back then, nowadays we don't have those guidelines anymore. Nobody tells us really, really what casual looks like. Mm -hmm. We just make those choices ourselves. But to come back to that very amazing example uh, that you shared, there are always two things I want you to take into consideration when it comes to your visual appearance. First, how does it impact yourself and your confidence. Mm -hmm. You gotta stick true to yourself. If wearing a suit all the time sounds horrible to you, then don't do it because it will impact your self-confidence, your self-esteem. And voters will instantly feel that. If you don't feel confident about yourself, why should they feel confident you can help them with your their issues that mm -hmm. they hope you to solve? However, the second group after yourself you have to take into consideration is your audience, your potential voters. Mm -hmm. What do they want? They want to feel that you are one of them, that you understand their lives, that you understand their issues, that you understand the circumstances that they live on. Now, there is no statistic for how people dress in Pennsylvania, 
But if we follow our gut feeling, what do you think? Will you see more people in Pennsylvania wearing a suit every single day or something rather casual? So he did a very smart thing that might change in the future the more responsible he becomes and the more his audience changes, right? But for that specific campaign, what he did is he signalized visually, I'm one of you. I understand your issues. I'm not putting myself on a pedestal and I'm higher than you. I'm, I'm better than you. I'm dressing up because I have to represent you somewhere else. He made himself one of them. And as we see, it was very successful. Yeah, I can't argue with his success. Um, but he did have, I'm one of you working class people, myself. I have lived in tough areas. Uh, he made it a point to go to counties that he did not think he would win. And his dress kind of became his brand. Right, the everyday you. kind of guy who had more in touch with them than the fellow who moved there from New Jersey to run for the Senate in Pennsylvania. And voila, that race was not even close. So here's the mistake that we often make. We think that this is an unconscious choice. He just doesn't care, right? He has uh, more important things to do. I believe that this was a very conscious choice. Oh, to give it was. An example from the corporate market. Uh, we all know Mark Zuckerberg for his sweaters and mm -hmm. flip-flops and rather casual style. But here's the reality. Whenever Mark Zuckerberg needs money, he thinks a suit is a very good idea. Mm -hmm. And so his style might also change now given his potential new role, but he is very, very conscious about these choices that he made and they led him to success. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk about the B the behavior. Um, I counsel candidates that I work with to be very conscious of their temper. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Every candidate is going to have a bad day. You're going to have some terrible days because we're all human and we make mistakes, including candidates. There are going to be days when they're frustrated with their staff. There are going to be days when somebody didn't perform like they should have, days when they're late. And I tell candidates is find a way to keep the steam from spouting off in the wrong place. If that means you need to exercise, if that means you need to go to church on Sunday for some religious input or something, you have to get rest and you must be calm at all occasions because everybody has one of these now. And the minute you're in public, you're on camera somewhere or somebody's recording what you say. And all it takes, it takes forever to convince people that you're a really decent person, but one fatal blow up in front of a staff member or on stage, or at a reporter, you can blow it all in one minute. And I, I'm going to use this, this example. I um, candidate in Arizona this year who made it a habit of every public appearance that she made, she either picked a fight with a reporter or threatened a reporter or... Uh, told members of the press that their life would be hell when she was elected governor and she was expected to win. And voila, surprise, she lost. And I have to believe that some of this behavior that she engaged in was off-putting, if not scary, to the people who saw her do it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I would like to add everything you just said is so valuable. And then I would like to add another perspective on it. And that is that your voters are also very emotional. Mm -hmm. We would like to think that they make all decisions rational. 
that they really compare us one to one on the facts and figures with other candidates. But the reality is that the conscious part of your mind only takes 5%. The 95% are all subconscious areas where we follow our gut feeling. Mm -hmm. While we would like them to behave like Spock, Mm -hmm. they actually behave like Homer Simpson all the time. And so if you take that into consideration, then you know that emotional balance between you as a candidate and the voters is very, very important. And you will receive what you plant. If you plant that you are emotionally imbalanced, yes, there are people who will value that and you will find some voters, but what kind of people? They are emotionally imbalanced too, because they understand your language, not just the words that you say also, how you say it, and that's why you attract them. Mm -hmm. But if I want to ask you, do you really want to work with emotionally imbalanced voters supporting you? You will probably say no. That's why it's so important that you control your own emotions, that you enter every situation with empathy, that you don't react in the way they react on, they react to, towards you, right? Mm -hmm. Emotional balance is, is in particular in your area incredibly important because we as voters want to be led by somebody who has control over his or her or their emotions. And we also know that they are doing something we actually don't understand. We give them our voice, we give them our vote, but whatever they do afterwards is actually, you know, it's unknown to us how they do it. Mm -hmm. And so we just trust our gut feelings by signing a candidate where we say, this is the person I trust and I'm going to vote. But the reality, most of them afterwards move on anyway. Um. You mentioned communication. Mm -hmm. uh, I spend a lot of time with clients that I have helping them craft their words. Mm -hmm. uh, I find that words used properly that uh, appeal to the emotional sense of voters, of empathy, uh, um, of compassion, of a forward-looking view, as opposed to spewing hate, makes all the difference in the world. And, but you mentioned in what you said that communication is more than words. Mm -hmm. It's not just what you say, it's how you say it and the way you act when you say it sometimes a difference between what someone is saying and the way they're behaving that creates a confusion among voters who see them because what they're saying does not comport to the way they're behaving exactly so well, we call it leakage leakage what? okay the, the people don't really know what is off it's not that they look at you and say oh that's his or her body language and this is what they say but there is some sort of leakage and it makes people unconsciously nervous. Some, something is just off. We can't really grab it, but something is off what is just happening. And uh, why is it important to you? You want to avoid distraction for any price. The moment they are distracted by something, they are not listening to your message anymore. They are subconsciously thinking about what is off right now, right? And you yeah. always want to be so clear, so concise, so short, so simple with your words that they understand what you are about. And so if you distract with something like your body language or your facial expressions or any other leakage that might happen, you are not doing yourself a favor because they are distracted. Okay. Um, I think I've worked with probably 350 people through the years with the words and every conversation I ever have with a candidate at the outset is, 
well, what do you hope to accomplish if you get the job? What difference do you want to make? And it goes against the grain because there are some in this profession that say, well, I'll tell you exactly what to say and you just do and say what I said. And here's the problem I have with that. If a candidate is saying something they only half-heartedly believe, mm -hmm. they'll never be able to say it with any passion. They will not be able to say it with any authenticity. And voters will figure it out. Mm -hmm that they really don't believe what they are saying and it will ruin a campaign. Absolutely, because your only option is if you're not saying what you want to say because it's in you, you have to memorize it, right? Right. You memorize the words somebody else gave you. And we notice that, we subconsciously notice that. We might not put a pin on memorizing, but there is something off. There is leakage. It's a very great example for leakage that you just shared. Yeah. Um, very interested in some things that you might share about your digital footprint. And I have what I call a horror story about this one. Mm -hmm. um, about a year and a half ago, I was working in a U.S. Senate campaign just getting off the ground, the candidate had delegated to a couple of people in his headquarters the job of putting up posts on social media and so on. And he said, please check in with them once a week or so and make sure this is being done correctly. Mm -hmm. And one day I noticed some Facebook posts with grainy pictures and graphics that weren't properly put on the page. And during the meeting, I said to the campaign staff, who's doing these graphics for you? I said, well, we're relying on a volunteer. And I said, you need to fire this volunteer because this volunteer is making your candidate look like doo-doo because when their digital footprint looks like slop, people will assume that this guy is slop. Mm -hmm. They objected to what I said, but it wasn't very long after that that I noticed the candidate completely changed his staff and started insisting on good-looking graphics. But it was a point that this is not a place to scrimp. If the picture you're using is awful, if the graphics go, my God, go get some help and get somebody who knows what they're doing, because this may be the only impression you make with some of the voters. Mm -hmm. But yeah. digital media is more than Facebook. It's now Twitter, TikTok, YouTube. What am I missing? Instagram. Instagram. And there will be many more coming. Yeah. So it and the first piece of advice that I want to share with you, even if you do not plan to be active on all those platforms, you need to own your name on the internet. Meaning you need to go on those platforms and instantly, instantly sign up. And in the best case with one name that you can, the same name that you can own on Instagram, on TikTok, on YouTube, even if you don't plan to use those channels. Because if you don't own your name, somebody else could. Mm -hmm. Every single day I could just sign up on Twitter and create a Jay Thompson account. And you wouldn't even find out who is behind it. So if one of your opponents or somebody who is not meaning well to you grabs that name or even accidentally is not even aware that you exist and then a horror story happens on the other end, you are in trouble. Right. So you need to make sure that you own your name on the internet, no matter if you are trying planning to use all the social media platforms. The same is true for your website. You need to own your URL. Even if you are not ready to put a website on right now, the URL has to be yours because otherwise somebody else could grab it and build a website. And then second, you need to purposefully create an online footprint. Every single day, people are going to Google your name and you cannot control that anymore. But what you can control is what they actually find. 
Mm -hmm. So then more strategically and purposefully you create the content and put in front of them, the more unlikely they will find something that you don't want them to see, which shouldn't be out there in the first place anywhere. But maybe you also have a long corporate career and everything that they find about right now is about that corporate career. Or you are a small business owner and everything they find about you is your information as a business owner. So you need to be very purposefully create content that lands on page one of Google that when potential voters search for you, they instantly identify you and see that they see you and will check you out. And how do they do that? By your appearance, by your behavior, and by your communication and your environment. Mm -hmm. Meaning, appearance. What are the visuals that are out there? How do you look like on pictures? What is the quality of the pictures? It is just a random selfie that you took? Or are you so established, even if you are at the beginning of your political career, that you at least hired a professional photographer for a headshot for some lifestyle shots? What are you wearing in those pictures? The principles apply offline and online. The same is for your behavior. How are you emotionally balanced on the internet? If somebody attacks you on your Facebook page, how do you react to that? What are your business etiquette skills? How do you behave? What is your attitude? Do you showcase your attitude positive on social media or negative? What are the words that you use? And while they might not hear our voice in text posts, mm -hmm. we can hear it in between the lines. But maybe you also have videos where we can see you working. So all the principles that apply for the ABC in real life, including the environment, also apply online. But there is one big difference. And the difference is that it's accessible all the time. While if you are in a room and you say something without really planning it through, and the moment you said it out loud, you know, oh, that was probably not the smartest way to say it. It's gone. As long as it's yeah. not captured with a phone or the press is there, it's gone. It evaporates in the air. Mm -hmm. Not the same on the internet. Once you said something, it's out there. And even if you go online 10 minutes later and delete that post, chances are somebody took a screenshot. Chances are somebody can retrieve that post. So it's out there forever. It doesn't happen in the moment. It happens for eternity. And that is the big risk. Uh, there have been, I've, it's the last 10 years, I've seen more careers ruined because of what some one tweeted or retweeted on Twitter. I've never seen someone lose an election because of something they didn't tweet or post on Facebook. Yes. I've seen a lot of candidates lose because of something they did. Mm -hmm. And they can never escape it. They can't hide it. The minute you post something, somebody has a copy of it. Mm -hmm. One other thing I, I would mention in passing is there, the popular social media uh, outlets today may or may not be here in 10 years. Mm -hmm. We're going to evolve. Uh, TikTok was nowhere two or three years ago. And today, if you want to reach young voters, you got to be on TikTok. That's mm -hmm. the way it is. So it's important in politics to be where people are in your target demographic. And it's important to some extent, um, Sylvia, I think, to make sure that your branding is consistent. If you are using a headshot, that headshot needs to be on every single one. You need to look like the same person. Otherwise, they're not going to get the right kind of picture. If in one, you look like you're 30, and if another one, there you are, it looks like 55 years old, they don't get the proper picture of you. And it is one thing that I would emphasize about your logo, your branding, your slogan. It needs that part of your brand needs to be on everything that you're using. Remember that I said our brains are actually quite lazy. They don't mm -hmm. like to work. 
That's why consistency is so important for the brains of your potential voters. They don't want to take the time and compare you and say, is this the same person like it is here? It looks so different. Or even, is this the same person I just saw at an event here? He or she or they look 20 years younger, right? Mm -hmm. Our brain likes to think in patterns. And you need to offer them a pattern, a consistency in the way you appear also online. Mm -hmm. So your brand needs to be consistent along all social media platforms. However, what you can still do is, once you have defined your brand, you can adjust your messaging based on the audience you have on that platform. Not saying that you are a different person, but saying that, on TikTok, what will bring you in front of a huge audience is probably simple videos, straightforward, talking into the camera, using encouraging, moderating language, because that's what the audience on TikTok wants to see. But if you draft a LinkedIn post, you probably want to position yourself more as the in-depth expert there. Those are the topics I'm going to handle for you. Those are the areas I have identified are wrong. And here are the solutions that I offer all of us um, mm -hmm. to fix. While if you go on YouTube and you present yourself um, as an expert in front of a camera like we just do, then it's probably more of a conversational style. Either you talk to the camera and explain uh, a rather complex topic or you invite somebody and discuss an issue with them. So while you have a consistent brand over all the platforms, it's important to adjust the way you communicate on those platforms based on who you are trying to reach. Yeah, very true. I want to mention something about the environment because it's a topic of the press this week. Mm -hmm. um, for the last four days, I've been reading in the newspaper about Donald Trump having dinner with a couple of unsavory people. Mm -hmm. And it's not a one-day story. This is now day five of people that uh, just controversy about the people he had dinner with in Florida. And it is relevant to something that you've mentioned, that voters also tend to judge you by the company you keep. They judge you by your interaction with your family, your spouse, your children, your campaign staff, the way you treat other people. And it goes to the point is that camera is always on. And in fact, in politics, nothing is a secret very long, including who you had dinner with last night. You are on stage 365 days a year, 24 mm -hmm. hours a day. And so the fantastic example that you just shared, two things come uh, together uh, here. First, yes, the environment matters, but B, what you are facing, especially with press and media, is something we call negativity bias. Every single human has to some sort or to some level a bias in them that is called negativity bias. We rather see the things that are wrong than the things that are right. So, and we get so caught up in that moment that we focus on that, on, on that negative information we just received that we simply ignore everything going on around you, us. Uh, I give you an example. If you are at an event, for example, uh, at a conference and you sit in the audience, or even if you are a speaker, if you as a politician are on stage, you will not walk out and say, well, at today's event, everybody set up so straight and had such an amazing body language. But if you see one of the people in your audience just hanging in there or slouching, mm -hmm. our eye and our brain is instantly drawn to that person because we carry negativity by us in us. And mm -hmm. you will remember that person more 
than the other 200, 300,000 people who actually were sitting up straight for you. Mm. So, and the press loves bad news. They love things like that. So they will instantly pick it up and make it a big topic. I share another example. Years ago, uh, a governor ran for the second time in uh, his estate and um, yes, got reelected and had a fantastic speech on that evening when he got reelected. It was, it was very emotional. It was very driven. It was beautiful to listen to. Behind him on camera was um, his wife. And she somehow was distracted. She looked around, she talked to people. Obviously, we couldn't hear what she was saying. She started fumbling around with her hair, then she fixed her bra at one point. She was just not in the moment while all eyes were on him, supposedly. What happened the next morning? The press was full of messages and information about her, not about the very important things that he said as he got reelected, not about the promises that he made for his state. It was all about his wife. And in fact, they already went three steps further and questioned her ability in case he would ever run um, as president. Would she be a good first lady representing us this way? So you need to make sure that Everybody on your campaign team, and I always include the family into that campaign team too, mm -hmm. is on stage 365 days too. Your campaign can be easily ruined, not by just yourself, it can be ruined by somebody you hired for your social media, somebody you are married to, somebody you gave birth to. And they don't even have to do this on purpose, but they need to understand that they are on your campaign team mm -hmm. and that uh, a lot of media and press is driven by negativity bias. So whatever they want to find, they are going to find it. They will. This was a little before your time as a New Yorker, but I remember Rudy Giuliani's first inaugural speech after he was elected mayor, I believe the year was 1993 is when he was elected and he gave his inaugural speech in January. Nobody remembers a word that he said because he allowed his young son to stand on stage. And during Giuliani's entire speech, the son stood next to him and made faces. And that's mm -hmm. all anyone will ever remember about Giuliani's maiden speech in New York City. Yes, yes, so yes. Not if your young son can't behave himself, mm -hmm. don't put him in a place where everybody's going to see it. Yes. So, all right. And on top, I would also like to encourage you to think about that environment from the perspective you are responsible for them too, because your actions also will have an impact on how we see them mm -hmm. and how the world perceives them. You and I have studied intensively a politician who also ran as a mayor for New York City in the past and for whatever reason decided to put out a tweet that shows the half part of his body uh, half naked, not just once, twice, third. We both know he ended up. The consequence was he ended up in prison for a right. while for his activities. But I need you to look a little bit beyond this. This is just social media one-on-one, -on -one, right? We all know today, not a good idea, not ethical, just don't do it. We know that, right? But look beyond that, that one tweet, what impact it has on his wife and her career. Look at that one tweet on what impact it had on an entire campaign team that lost their job. Yeah, and look at that tweet, what impact it has on his little son, I think back then, two years old, or maybe a little bit younger, who quite frankly didn't understand at this point what was happening, but who now is older and for the rest of his life has to handle his father's digital footprint. Mm -hmm. Every time they are going to Google his son's name in the future, his so colleagues at school, his teachers, his neighbors, his friends, they will find 
his father's footprint and not his first. So you also have a responsibility for your environment and the people that you invite to be part of that environment. So very true. Um, Sylvie, just uh, before we go here, let's just imagine that you uh, have been approached. And well, let's start with this. If someone would like to work with you on all of the stuff that we have talked about, how do they get a hold of you? Thank you very much for asking them. Yeah. At any given time, they can go to my website, which is sylviedijusto.com, which mm -hmm. is not the easiest name to write and spell out, but uh, I bet you will add it somewhere in the show notes or wherever you uh, publish this, or just Google Speaker Coach First Impressions. And if I don't show up then, then there is either something wrong with my website or you don't have internet. But uh, at every single moment, I invite you to reach out if you um, need any help. I have learned from great coaches and advisors like you to serve this community of people who serve our country and to really appreciate that I'm here to help. And if we need to work a little bit more on it than just a quick question, well, then let's find a way. Okay. All right. We'll make sure to do that. Now, final thoughts. Let's say you're approached by someone in, uh, say, 20s, early 30s, and they say, tell me where to start to make sure that I leave a good impression on people that I meet. Parting thoughts. Yes, final thoughts. So in corporate environments, I say, if you want to become the CEO of an organization one day, you have to start to appear, behave, and communicate like a CEO already today. Meaning in your role, yes, it's easy to say, just think of the next office I'm running and the next office I'm running and the next office I'm running. But what I want you to do instead is what is going to be the last office that you want to run for? Do you want to run as the president of the United States? Well, then you have to keep that goal in mind already today, even if you are at the beginning, because throughout your journey, you need to leave hints that you are capable of one day having that important role in that office. If you only think about the next step, you are limiting yourself, first of all, self-limiting beliefs, but you're also limiting the opportunities that potential voters have out there to see a future president in you. Very sound advice. Thank you very much. Thank I have you. learned a lot from experts like about the past many years of friendship. I am so grateful and blessed. And let's just make it another day. Okay. Uh, Sylvie, I want to thank you for your time today. You've been delightful. And hopefully, lots of people will benefit by what you've had to say. Thank you very much. Uh, it has been such a joy. Every moment with you is always a joy, but to speak about a topic we both are so passionate about uh, is an extra joy. I know that all your candidates are in such amazing hands with your advice, and thank you for the opportunity to allow me to share a little bit of my area of um, expertise. Everybody who is running for an office out there, thank you very much for your service. I know it's not easy and it is hard work, but we need passionate people like you to represent the average person like me in your office. Thank you. Thank you. You have a wonderful day.